we've been making our way through this book of 1 Corinthians, and last week uh, we got a start in chapter 11 uh, and considered the first 16 verses of the chapter where Paul is talking about God's plan and role for uh, women and, and their particular place uh, in the home and in the church and, and those matters in the first 16 verses of the chapter. But in chapter 11, verse 17, he sort of shifts the focus and starts talking about the Lord's Supper, uh, communion, the Lord's table, whatever you'll call it. And uh, the best way for us to come into it is just to jump in here at verse 17, where we read, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. I mean, it's amazing that Paul would write to the Corinthians, and again, we're talking about the Christians in a city called Corinth, and he would write to these Corinthian Christians and say, yeah, you guys come together as a church, you come together as a congregation, but you don't come together for the better, but for the worse. He, he writes to the Corinthians the same way he might write to a lot of people or a lot of churches today. When they come together, it's not for the better. It's for the worse. I think it's amazing how uh, in some churches, either because of the spiritual environment or poor leadership or poor pastoring, when people leave the church, they're perhaps worse off spiritually than when they came. Yeah, they came together with other people, but not for the better, but for the worse. Now, it was to their credit that they did gather together, but sadly, it wasn't for the better. <clears throat> now, a large part of the problem with the gathering of the Corinthian Christians was that there were divisions among them. Did you see that there in verse 17 and 18? He says, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. Now, Paul had heard this, and he knew the history and the character of these Corinthian Christians. He knew how likely it would be that there would be divisions among them. And he had already dealt with the problem of divisions. We kind of read that way back in chapter 1. But I think it's interesting what he says here in verse 19, and I ask you to pay close attention to it. He's talking about this whole issue of divisions and factions in the body. Take a look at verse 19. It says, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now, we usually think of factions and divisions among Christians as a bad thing. And most of the time they are. Most of the dividing lines that Christians make among themselves are really unnecessary and very unspiritual. They just don't need to be there. But Paul's saying sometimes these factions... Uh, are greatly used of God, that he has a purpose in allowing them. And what's the purpose? That those who are approved may be recognized among you. God allows factions or divisions within a group of Christians so that over time, those who really belong to God will be made evident. You know, just going to church doesn't make you a true follower of Jesus Christ. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. And among this group of churchgoers in the city of Corinth, Paul says that the divisions and the factions, though they're not good in themselves, God raises up a purpose out of them. And it's to show those who are approved and that they may be recognized among them. Well, now he's going to kind of get on to one of the things that was causing a lot of problems in the Corinthian church. Kind of interesting. If you take a look at verse 20, he says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and the other is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Now, we can't understand what Paul's talking about here unless we understand a little bit of the custom and the practice of the early church. It was very common in the early church when they would meet together week by week to have a meal together. We'd call it a potluck supper. They would get together and have a shared meal together. Typically, they would do this on a weekly basis, though not necessarily so. It's not like it's anything commanded in the Bible. It was as much a cultural thing as anything among them. But they'd get together for this potluck supper, so to speak, every week. And at that gathering would be when they would have communion. Now, we typically do it.
on a uh, Sunday morning or whenever, and we pass out the little cups and the little pieces of bread. And again, that's a fine way to, to recognize the Lord's Supper and to take communion. But the way that they did it in the early church was oftentimes just in the whole context of the potluck supper. You could see them and, you know, before everybody heads out for dessert, uh, somebody in the church say, okay, wait, wait, let's remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And they pass out bread and they pass around the cup and they say, let's remember his broken body and his spilled blood on our behalf. We remember you, Lord Jesus. And you can think of it very simply happening, happening that way. But the problem was that the Corinthian Christians uh, were just basically acting like selfish jerks. And so when they got together at the potluck, uh, first of all, you had, and you may recognize this from some church potlucks you've been to, you know, you got kind of the piggy people up there loading up the plates. You know, some people are really glad I'm getting at those, uh, those vital issues in the church today now. You got the people who are going up in the front line, loading up their plates, and uh, you get, you know, half a dozen or a dozen of those people through the line, and what's left over for the people after them? You know, and so Paul is saying this was a real problem at their uh, church potluck suppers. Look at it, verse 21. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Well, you know, they would be drinking wine at these two. And so you'd have some people just down in the, the wine. You'd have other people loading up their plates. And so the people behind them weren't getting much of anything. And their selfish conduct at this common meal was disgracing their observance of the Lord's Supper. And, and so you see, some people would leave that church potluck hungry. Now, you know, that would leave a real bad taste in your mouth, especially associating it with the Lord's Supper. And Paul's saying, listen, this doesn't work. This doesn't work for you guys to be selfish. It doesn't work for you all to just be um, uh, looking for an advantage over one another. And then at the same time, be celebrating the Lord's Supper in the same context. Now, uh, Paul's saying, listen, you've got houses to eat and drink in. You know, look, if you just want to grind on some food, you know, go to Taco Bell or something, man. You know, go get some of those 29 cent hamburgers at McDonald's before you come to the potluck. You know, that's what Paul would say. Take care of it there. If you want to eat or drink selfishly, do it at home. And he says it again. Look at the end there at verse 22. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. I mean, Paul sounds exasperated, doesn't he? He's like, I don't know what to do with you people. How can you act this way? How can you think this is something good? And so now in verse 23, he's going to talk to them about how they should really conduct the Lord's Supper. He says, for I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I think it's interesting that Paul begins this section, these few verses where he talks about how he conducts and how the church should conduct the Lord's Supper, is he says that he received it from the Lord. He wasn't just making this up. This wasn't just Paul's idea on what would be a good way to have it. He says, you know, I received this from the Lord. Now, some people think, well, you know, was it some spectacular visitation from God that Paul had? How was it that Paul received this? Well, I'll tell you how I believe Paul received this from the Lord and how he knew it was the Lord was we know from Paul's missionary journeys that a guy who traveled with Paul for at least a couple years was a man named Luke, a doctor. And Luke went out and did very careful research on the life of Jesus and put it into the gospel that goes by his name in your New Testament right now. And if you notice, the account of the Lord's Supper in the gospel of Luke is very similar to the account that we have right here. So I believe that Paul is just saying, hey, I know this is from the Lord because Luke, you know, researched it and, and he gave it to me. And so he says in verse 23, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Now, Paul, in remembering the events of 
Jesus's life on that night before the crucifixion, he recalls that not only was Jesus crucified by a foreign power, but he was betrayed by his own. And so he says here that what Jesus did first in the Lord's Supper is gave thanks. Did you see that in verse 24? And when he had given thanks. Isn't that amazing? Here he is, the simplest bread and some wine. And Jesus gives thanks to God the Father for that. Now, the first thing I think that that rebukes us is our just selfishness, our, our, you know, our jadedness. If we had a meal that simple, how many of us would sincerely give thanks to God for it? Or would we be more likely to complain? But Jesus gave thanks for it. But the second thing that amazes me is, don't you think there'd be enough on his mind? Jesus knows he's going to be crucified the next day. Yet he takes the time and it shows his heart to give thanks to God in heaven for something as simple as this. So he's going to give thanks for it. And then notice he says, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, the bread that Jesus broke was not be like a, a, a loaf of wonder bread. Uh, it wasn't like that kind of bread or French bread or that. It would have been unleavened bread. This was a Passover meal. And you couldn't have anything with yeast or leaven at it, a Passover meal. It would have been that flat matzah type bread. Uh, or it may not have been crispy like matzah bread, but it would have been flat nonetheless, sort of like a very flat tortilla. Uh, that kind of bread that they would have had. And commonly in the Middle East, when they would have eaten that kind of bread, they would have it and they would like fold it and, and use it and eat it that way in their meals. And actually, it's very good. I, I like eating that kind of bread and tortillas with things. And it, it's a great thing. But they that's the kind of thing Jesus would do. Now, he would take it and he would break it and distribute it among the disciples. And again, this was something commonly done at the Passover meal. Please remember that when Jesus did this, he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And typically, when they would take a piece of bread to eat it in the ceremony of the Passover, they would take a piece of bread about the size of a quarter or a half dollar. That was to be about the size, and they would take it and distribute it. Now, some people have wondered about the bread that people might partake of communion today. Um, does it have to be unleavened? What kind of bread can it be or should it be? Um, I don't see any reason to be legalistic about it, but I, I do think it's appropriate for the bread to be unleavened. I mean, just because that's the kind of bread Jesus would have used. But I, I don't think it's like blasphemy or something legalistic to be about. But when we serve communion here, we use unleavened bread because it's really not so much that. It's more speaking to us of the body of Jesus. Now, of course, uh, the the leaven itself is a picture of sin, and that's why for some people it's so offensive to have this idea of sin in the body of Jesus, and that's why they wouldn't want to do it. But, you know, some people aren't familiar with that picture from the Bible, and so it just doesn't bother them as much. Now, you, you may or may not know that uh, when Calvary Chapel down in Costa Mesa first started and was growing and was really ministering to the, the hippie crowd in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, people who didn't like the church, liked to start rumors about it. And they couldn't understand why all these kids were coming to the church and just liking it so much. And so they started the rumor that at Calvary Chapel, uh, they served communion with Coke and potato chips. Uh, now that would be inappropriate. Uh, but of course, it was just a rumor. It was never a, never a fact. But the, the bread itself would have been unleavened. And again, Jesus would have been celebrating the Passover, which was a remembrance of Israel's deliverance from Egypt, recorded for us there in the book of Exodus. So the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine were important parts of the Passover celebration. And Jesus took these important pictures and reminders of Israel's deliverance from Egypt, and he added to them the meanings connected with his own death on the cross. So Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Now again, as the Passover feast featured this unleavened bread, they used this unleavened bread in the Passover supper 
And the way that bread would be breaked, it would have uh, scorch marks on it from the, the way it was prepared on the, on the griddle, so to speak. It would have those scorch marks, which would be analogous to stripes on it. And then it would have like little holes or pock marks in it, analogous to the piercing that Jesus would have. And so each little piece of bread would serve as a reminder of Jesus' uh, beaten and broken body there on the cross. And he took those pieces of bread and passed them around, and each one of the disciples ate of it. You really have to wonder that first night that they took that communion, at that last supper. And again, it, it's not like Leonardo da Vinci's painting, you know, where they're all there on the one side. You know, it's like, okay, everybody pose to the picture, come around the one side of the table. <laughs> they would have been sitting around what a kind of table called a triclinium. And they would have been sort of laying down. That's how they would have ate uh, a ceremonial meal in that day. And as they would have ate this meal, they would have been talking and laughing. I mean, the Passover meal was not like this super solemn, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, scary thing. It was a happy occasion. It was something fun and, and celebrative. But y- you have to wonder, as, as they took this bread and said, t- this is my body broken for you, if they really understood. And they probably didn't. But Paul's saying, I want you to understand. What Jesus did on the cross was he laid down his body and it was broken and it received the judgment of God that you and I deserved. And then he goes on to say, in the same manner, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, in receiving the cup at communion, we're called to remember the blood of Jesus and the new covenant. Now, the Passover meal would also feature several cups of wine. And each cup of wine at the Passover meal would have a different title. The cup Jesus referred to in his Passover meal and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood. It was called the cup of redemption. And Jesus added to the reminder of redemption from slavery in Egypt. That's what Passover was all about. He added the idea that his blood would confirm a new covenant that would change our relationship relationship with God. Friends, our relationship with God is founded on covenant. From the very beginning of time, God has had covenant with mankind. In the days of Abraham, God established a covenant with Abraham and a covenant with Moses and the nation of Israel and a covenant with David. Now I want you to see what what audacity Jesus has here. Friends, do you realize that Jesus is standing before his people and saying, I'm making a new covenant between God and man. That's pretty radical, isn't it? Could you imagine Moses saying that? Isaiah, David, Jesus is greater than all of them. I'm establishing a new covenant. And this new covenant is going to be sealed in my blood. Oh, that's audacious for anybody to claim. But it was true. You know, way back in the pages of the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 31 is remarkable in this. Tells us that the new covenant is all about this new relationship that God wants us to have with him. And it's a relationship not founded on what we do for God, but founded on what he does in us. And where's your relationship with God? Maybe you think about your relationship with God primarily in terms of what you have to do for him. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. You think you got to do something to make God love you, and that's why you're here. Friends, can I just tell you, your relationship with God is not based on what you do for him. It's based on what Jesus Christ has done for you on the new covenant that he sealed in his blood. And he promises to give us an inner transformation and a cleansing from sin and a new close relationship with him. Friends, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can have a new covenant relationship with God. You need to ask yourself and just seriously consider, are you living that kind of new covenant relationship? That's what communion should speak of you every time. A new covenant, a new and living way that we can come to God through Jesus Christ. You know, I think is remarkable about this. Look how verse 26 ends this little section. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Not only does this communion, does the Lord's table look back to what Jesus did on the cross and look back to the Passover deliverance, but it also looks forward to the return of Jesus. Jesus. 
that we're to keep doing this until Jesus comes. It's almost like we're toasting uh, what Jesus is going to do. You know, we do it till he comes again. And we keep in mind that Jesus is coming again. You know, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, Jesus spoke of the longing expectation that he had when he would take communion with his people in heaven. You know, that's going to be the ultimate Lord's Supper. When we get to heaven, we're going to sit around a great big table. I guess it's going to be a lot of tables. (laughs) But Jesus is going to be there. He's going to be the host of this banquet. And we're all going to take communion together with him. And Jesus is going to say to his people, you don't know how long I've waited to have all of you with me here and we could take communion together. Isn't that going to be great? I can't wait for that. And uh, that's what Paul is looking forward to here. Now, I can't leave this section without speaking about some theological controversy that's come up about the whole deal with the Lord's Supper. Because the precise nature of the bread and the cup of wine in communion has been the source of great theological controversy. Uh, The Roman Catholic Church holds the idea, and here's your fancy theological word for the night, transubstantiation. And the doctrine of transubstantiation teaches that that bread and that uh, wine actually becomes, not symbolically, not spiritually, not in, it actually becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. His flesh and His blood. And when you receive that bread and when you drink that cup, you are eating the actual flesh of Jesus and you are drinking His actual blood because God makes it the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, I remember when I was a kid and uh, growing up uh, and going to the Roman Catholic Church, you know, uh, going to your first communion was a big deal. And you had to be trained, you know, how to do this. Uh, I see it nowadays. They've made so many changes in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, they'll give them the, the, the communion wafer and they'll let you hold it in your hands. Man, let me tell you something. There was none of that when I was a kid. Because what if you dropped it? You're dropping Jesus on the ground. You can't have that. And so uh, they would give you the the thing and and the priest would put it on your tongue. And then you thought, well, do you chew it? You know, what do you do? I mean, it's kind of, you know, man. And you're just supposed to like let it there and it would just kind of dissolve and and get this funny texture to it in your mouth. And sometimes it would stick to the roof of your mouth really bad. Well, and then I always wondered why they never let us drink from the cup. The priest would drink from a cup. We never got to. Nowadays, they do. Like I say, so many changes just from when I was a kid, which wasn't that long ago. (laughs) You know, so many changes. But even when they would put that communion wafer in your mouth, one of the altar boys would come along with a little little silver tray and put it in it. Because what if they dropped it? You can't let Jesus fall to the ground. Well, you know why they didn't give you the cup? Was because you might spill it. And you would be spilling the blood of Jesus all over the church. And uh, they had special ceremony. What do you do with the leftover communion wafers? Well, they had a special place where they were ceremonially burnt, which seemed almost more ghastly to me, you know, burning the body of Jesus. I never got that. There's been huge debates in the history of the church. You know, people saying, you can't withhold the cup from the people. But the priests were like, it's too serious a deal. You can't let them spill the the blood of Jesus. And they'd say, well, you know, if you eat somebody's flesh, there's blood in it. So they're eating the blood just when they take the way. And they would talk in these terms to try to explain it and to say why it was okay to keep the cup from the people. And I mean, it it just, I, I never got it. (laughs) now martin luther held to the idea and here's your second theological word for the evening of consubstantiation which teaches that the bread remains bread and the wine remains wine but by faith they are actually the same as jesus's physical body and blood So it's not the actual body of Jesus, not the actual blood of Jesus, but by faith, that's what it becomes to you. Luther did not believe in the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, but he didn't go very far from it. Now, John Calvin taught 
that Jesus' presence in the bread and the wine was real, but that it was spiritual, not physical. And another reformer named uh, Zwingli taught that the bread and the wine were mere symbols that represent the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, interestingly, this uh, was one of the big uh, dividing lines between the reformers. You know, you had these amazing men living at the same time, Martin Luther and Zwingli, and Calvin came along just a little bit later. I mean, he lived at the same time as Luther, but he, he was a little bit later on. And they were coming to all these uh, biblical understandings at the same time, and it would be only natural that they'd want to get together and compare notes and see if they're understanding the same things. And so Luther and Zwingli got together, them and some of their representatives, and a lot of this they did through the representatives, but they start going through, well, what do you think about the Bible? Well, we believe this. Hey, we believe the same thing. What do you believe about how a man is saved? Well, this is how, what we believe. Well, we believe the same thing. And, well, we believe it. We believe it. We believe it. And then they get through all this. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, well, what do you believe about uh, what the bread and the wine are in communion? And Zwingli says, he goes, well, listen, man, you know, what beautiful symbols. I mean, when I see that bread, man, it shows the broken body of Jesus. I, oh, it's a wonderful symbol to call to my mind the remembrance of what Jesus did for me on the cross, both the bread and the wine. Now, Luther, he couldn't get along in today's world. You know, you want to talk about a guy who's politically incorrect. This guy would just say what was on his mind and brilliant, and, but he was a very extreme man. And he just said, you guys are nuts. What are you talking about? And again, Luther did not move very far away from the uh, Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation. And Luther insisted that there be some kind of physical presence of the body and blood of Jesus in the bread and in the wine because Jesus said, this is my body. Matter of fact, it's said that at this meeting, Luther was pounding on the table, repeating in Latin over and over again, this is my body, and writing it in the velvet tablecloth that was there, and he was just going nuts. You, this is my body, Jesus said. Matter of fact, he even said that over this one issue, and again, this is the kind of you know emotional, temperamental man that Luther was. He said over this one issue that Zwingli and his fellow reformers were of another spirit because of this one issue. Well, Zwingli, when he heard this from Luther, he said, listen, Jesus said, I am the vine. Jesus said, I am the door. And we understand what he was saying. Jesus spoke in pictures of himself. And you know what Luther said? <laughs> Typical Luther. He said, I don't know. But if Christ told me to eat dung, I would do it because it would be good for me. And that's the kind of guy Martin Luther was. So uh, he saw it as a real important issue. He said, we're compromising the words of Jesus. And he thought Zwingli was compromising. And so they left in a big snit after agreeing over all these different things. Luther just foaming at the mouth. This is my body, Jesus said. Now, you know, it's interesting or even ironic later on. And again, this just kind of shows the temperamental nature of this great man of God, Martin Luther. By the way, if I can just talk for just a minute on Martin Luther, we're coming to the end of the, uh, of the millennium, aren't we? And if you think of the period of history from the year 1000 to the year 2000, I challenge you to come up with a man in history who has impacted the world more than Martin Luther. There is none. I just say it to you categorically. There is not a single man or woman who has impacted the world more in the last thousand years than Martin Luther. Absolutely positively. You know, Time Magazine comes out with the man of the year, the man of the decade. I don't know if they have a man of the century. If there is a man of the millennium, no one has impacted the world like Martin Luther this whole thousand years. So a great man of God. But again, temperamental by nature. And after this huge thing, foaming at the mouth, you know, practically excommunicating Zwingli and these other guys over this one issue. Later on, Luther was reading some of what Calvin wrote on what the Lord's Supper is. And what Calvin wrote was very, very similar to what Zwingli said. And you know what Luther said? He said, yeah, I agree with it. 
<laughs> and it's like, what? I don't, and who knows? Who knows? But he seemed to agree with it. Now, I think it's scriptural to say that the bread and the wine are symbols. But friends, they're not mere symbols. They are powerful pictures to partake of, to enter into as we see the Lord's table as the new Passover. You know, if you think about a Passover meal with the bitter herbs and with the, uh, uh, the apple mixture stuff that's like the mortar and the, the salt water and good heavens, that, that horseradish that just brings tears to your eyes. All of that stuff, it, it's not empty symbols. It's meant to really connect in your heart about historical truth and, and where God has done uh, great things in and through his people. That's exactly what the Lord's Supper is meant to do in our heart. Symbols, yes, but not empty symbols, not mere symbols. Powerful, God-appointed pictures of what he does. And one last thing before we move on to verse 27. Do you see this in verse 26 where he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Well, do you realize that every time you take communion, you're preaching a sermon? What? What? Yeah, I'm, telling, I'm looking at a, out over a room full of preachers here tonight. Because every time you take the Lord's Supper, you're preaching. That word proclaim in verse 26, it's the exact word in the original language for to preach. It could very just as legitimately be translated, you preach the Lord's death until he comes. When we take communion, we're preaching a sermon. You're preaching a sermon to God. You're saying, Lord, I just want to thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. You're preaching a sermon to the devil. You're saying, hey, buddy, this is what wiped you out right now. You're preaching a, a, a sermon to yourself and to everybody around you. You're preaching a sermon to the world. Say, you know what? The Christian life is not about what I do for God. It's about what he's done for me. I want to thank God for what Jesus did on the cross. So let me ask you, when you... Break bread and bow your heart before the Lord in communion. What kind of sermon are you preaching? You're preaching the sermon of, man, I wonder who's winning that football game. You're preaching the sermon of, I hope there's not a big line of Baja Fresh after church. <laughs> or are you preaching the sermon of, Jesus, I just want to take a few minutes out to thank you so much for what you did for me on the cross. Well, verse 27, Paul continues on and he says, Therefore, Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now notice this. He says, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Paul is warning the Corinthian Christians to treat the Lord's Supper with reverence and to practice it in a spirit of self-examination. Now, I need to point out something because these verses have been very misunderstood by many people. The thought here is not to exclude anyone from the Lord's table. The thought isn't, hey, buddy, you're not worthy to come here to the Lord's table. Don't you come here. You better back away. You're not worthy. No, you see, the King James Version of 1 Corinthians 11.27 has caused a lot of difficulty. Now again, I'm reading and I'm preaching from the New King James. It explains it much better because it says, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. In the regular King James, it says, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be brought guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That has made the idea in many people's minds that you have to make yourself worthy to receive communion. Now, I dare say, and you don't need to raise your hand, because I bet every honest heart here tonight would raise it. How many times have you come to take communion and you don't feel worthy of it at all? You say, you know what, man, I'm not worthy of this. Maybe you're just, you're just in sin. Maybe you're really compromised. Maybe, man, maybe you're just, and you say, man, I'm not worthy. I'm, and you know what you say? I'm not taking it. I'm just going to let it pass. Can I just say that's when you need to take it all the more? It's not a matter of us being worthy to take it. What Paul is talking about is the manner. Friends, they were pigging out and getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. That was an unworthy way to take it. 
Paul is not trying to say that you have to make yourself worthy to receive the Lord's Supper. And I'll, I'll continue on another thought. You know, some people seem to believe that, and, and this is a teaching, I'm, I don't want to make this a point of division or severe contention with people, but there are many Christians who believe that only Christians should partake of the Lord's table. You know, that if we're serving communion on a Sunday morning, that you should tell everybody, listen, if you're not a Christian, you better let that pass. Because you shouldn't partake of it. And I understand why people believe that, but I would just suggest this. When Jesus gave the Lord's Supper, that night before he was betrayed, you know who partook? Judas. Jesus didn't say, let's wait a few minutes, Judas is going to be gone. (laughs) Then we'll take it. (laughs) it's my belief that anybody who is willing to reverently thank Jesus for what he did on the cross can receive communion and I know that there's some brothers and sisters who may disagree with and I don't want to make it a big point of contention because I think that's a point that honest hearts can disagree with but sometimes in, in the church it's been a real bone of contention you know I remember seeing at a museum Funny little coins from colonial times in America. And you take a look at these coins, and and what were they? And the explanation was, they were communion tokens. And these were churches that were so serious about the thought that an unbeliever cannot take communion, that the pastor would examine each person to see if they were walking with the Lord. And if you were walking with the Lord, you'd receive a token, and then you could exchange that token for the, for the bread and the cup of communion at church. No token, no communion. And that's how serious it's been taken. But friends, if anyone needs to remember the work of Jesus on the cross, it's the one who's sinned. When we are repentant, our sin should drive us to Jesus. It should drive us to the cross, not away from it. Let me say this. If a Christian is in sin and stubbornly unrepentant, they're mocking what Jesus did on the cross to cleanse them from sin. You see, friends, we can never really make ourselves worthy of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He did it because of his great love for us. He didn't do it because you were so worthy or I was so worthy. He did it because of his great love. So as we take the bread and as we take the cup, and I don't know how many of you have done this, you know, you're feeling kind of unspiritual, but they're having communion that morning. And so you take that bread and you take that cup and you sort of stare at the floor and try to work up this really spiritual feeling inside yourself, you know. And, you know, I don't think that's how you should do it. Just open your heart to Jesus and recognize his presence with you and thank him for what he did on the cross. Now, he goes on to say, For whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Now, again, I don't think this is in a morbid display of self-examination to see if we're worthy of what Jesus did for us. Now, are you worthy to take communion? No, you're examining your conduct. You're examining, and again, think of it how the Corinthians were blowing it in this manner. They should have took a step back and examined and said, you know what, it's not right for me to be pigging out in front of my brother who's not getting any food, and that, well, let's all take communion together. I'll say, examine yourself, think about it. Examine yourself, but look at verse 29, and then, or verse 28 rather, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Another, examine yourself, then eat. The idea isn't to examine yourself and say, well, no, then you can't do it. No, examine yourself, set your heart in the right place, then partake. Verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. It's interesting that Paul says the person who partakes of communion irreverently. And you can just picture that, couldn't you? Somebody in their irreverent manner and they're mocking, taking communion in a mocking, frivolous way. Now, let me say, I, I think there needs to be a little bit of balance in understanding this. I don't think that communion should be 
this horribly somber and morbid thing. You know, well, you smiled. I mean, you're not right with God. You smiled when we took communion. It doesn't need to be this, you know, this dark, you know, like it's a funeral or something. But at the same time, it shouldn't be frivolous. It should be a sober-minded joy that takes appreciation of what Jesus has done for us. Now, the Corinthians were just making this a big, you know, drinking party. And Paul says, no, no, no. And your irreverent conduct at the Lord's table is inviting God's corrective discipline. He says, judge yourself so you would not be judged. Hey, isn't that a great rule for your whole life? No, if you'll discipline yourself before the Lord, he's not going to have to discipline you. Isn't that great? It's just like your kids, huh? And, uh, you know, we could all use a lot of uh, a lot fewer spankings uh, from the Lord the way our kids would, too. Now, the, the, the judgment here is significant. Did you notice this in verse 30? For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. Now, this is wild. I have to say this is kind of shocking to read this in the Bible. Paul is saying that because of your irreverent conduct at the Lord's table, many of you are weak, sick, and some sleep. You say, well, what's wrong with them sleeping? What, they're sleeping during service? No. He means, he means the dirt nap, baby. He means the big time sleep. He means, he means dead. And he's just referring to it in a, in a euphemistic way. He's saying they're asleep. They're dead. And basically what Paul's saying is, look, some people among you, what, you think that was funny to say dirt now? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a euphemistic way in uh, referring to it. You see, some of the Corinthian Christians were weak or sick or dead because of their irreverent conduct. Now, we, we stand back and we say, wait a minute, wow, this is heavy. You mean God would... would cause somebody to be weak or sick or dead because of their irreverence at the Lord's Supper? Yeah. Now, we shouldn't think that this is the only kind of sin that God would judge in such a way. But you know, as it's mentioned for us in 1 John chapter 5, which we just considered a few Sunday mornings ago, and then in Acts chapter 5, there are examples where believers sin to such a degree where God says, listen, I'm just going to bring them home. And it was a pretty severe thing in the eyes of the Lord. But notice this. It doesn't mean that these people lost their salvation. Look at this in this case, verse 32. He says, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Right? He's saying this was the Lord's dealing with them so that they wouldn't be condemned with the world. Not so that they would. So Paul makes it clear that he knew none of the Corinthian Christians, even those who had died as a result of God's corrective judgment, none of those had lost their salvation. They were chastened by the Lord so that they would not be condemned with the world. Well, he summarizes it all in these last two verses, 33 and 34. He says, Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. <laughs> you know, can I just say what Paul's telling you there in verse 33 and 34? Show some good manners. Wait for one another. Oh no, you first. Please, I insist. Why not? Would it kill you to show some manners? You know, and might I say, I, I think that's an important reason for us as Christians to show manners. And for us to teach our children good manners. You know, good manners are nothing more than just being polite and showing love. When you open the door for somebody, it's not like you're saying, well, you're so weak and incompetent, you don't even know how to open a door. You're just showing politeness and love. When you let somebody eat first, or when you prefer other people through the, the, the number of common courtesies, when you say please and thank you, you're just showing love. It's just appropriate for us to show love through our good manners and appropriate for us to display it and, and train our children that way. But it's difficult. Listen, you know how it is, folks. No matter how hard you try to teach your kids good table manners, they're still going to eat just like you do. 
And so you need to exemplify it, you know, every way. And that's just what Paul's saying. Look at a verse that wait for one another. That way, everybody gets enough to eat instead of some being gorged and the other going home hungry. And he says, if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. Don't pig out at the church common meal. Because it might mean that somebody else doesn't get enough to eat. And then if you notice there in verse 35, it says, lest you come together for judgment. He says, listen, maybe some more of you guys will be sleeping if you carry on this way. Paul says, listen, how silly to do all this just for the sake of food. Put it all in perspective. And then finally he says, and you saw that little line there at the end of verse 34, right? And the rest I will set in order when I come. Now when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Paul, Paul, what was the rest? (laughs) I got a feeling, you know, it's something that was just so embarrassing that he didn't want to implicate the Corinthians in Holy Scripture for the rest of eternity. And so he's just being like, look, I'm sick of talking about this stuff. I'm just going to set the rest of it in order when I come. There's more to say, but Paul's going to leave it for another time. Friends, do you really appreciate what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross? Do you live with a joyful remembrance of it? You know, we should be taking communion. And can I just suggest to you that you can take communion at some place other than at church? You know, you can take it at home with your family. Dad, you can sit the family around the table, maybe after a dinner some evening. Just pass around the bread and the cup and say, we just want to remember what Jesus did for us. You can do it. You can do it all by yourself. And you don't even have to use the bread and the cup to remember what Jesus did for you. But we're just grateful that the Lord has given us those things to make a very vivid reminder for us. But friends, live every day in remembrance. I can't say it enough. There's a huge dividing line between Christians. And there's like a grand canyon in between them. There's Christians on one side who think that the Christian life is primarily about what they have to do for God. And there's other people on the other side of the canyon, the glory side of the canyon, I might say, who understand that the Christian life, first and foremost, is about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And I hope that every time we take communion, you're letting that be your remembrance. Let's pray and spend some time in worship before the Lord.